just a brief introduction of, of me. I'm Jerry McCarthy at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park, and I'm the host of this talk this evening, which means basically <laughs> I'm going to let Elonka and Klaus <laughs> run everything anyway. Um, but uh, if you want to raise questions, you can put them in the chat window, and either, either Klaus or I will see them and uh, will respond as appropriate. So, Klaus and Elonka, would you care to begin? All right, thank you. You're so, um, first of all, we're very honored to have been invited to speak here. It was uh, very exciting uh, when, we, when we heard about this. Um, and um, so, uh, Klaus and I are giving this talk on famous and not so famous unsolved codes. Uh, some of you will have heard of uh, some of these and some you may not have heard of. The, um, uh, first, I'm Ilanka, Ilanka Dunin, and I have a website, ilanka.com. I have a page on the world's most famous unsolved codes, which has gotten millions of hits. And I'm Klaus Schmee. I'm a German uh, computer scientist and uh, IT security expert. I work as a security consultant for the German company CryptoVision. And I'm interested in the history of cryptography. And I also have a website or a blog. You see the URL there, schmee.org. And uh, yes, I've written a couple of books. And this is our new one. Yeah, we spent uh, three years working on this, a Code Breaking a Practical Guide. It just came out last month in the UK. We're, we're very proud of it. Um, and there is some information in there on unsolved codes, and there are many uh, that can be found at different places around the world. You can see these green dots there, and we're only going to cover a few of them, and even those are going to be covered very quickly. So first, we're going to go to the United States, uh, and my favorite, Kryptos. Uh, this is in Langley, Virginia. You can see it in my Zoom background here. I visited it not too long ago. And this is CIA headquarters in Langley. And on the right-hand side of the building here is the original headquarters building that they were outgrowing in the 1980s. And so they commissioned a new headquarters building uh, and um, art to go around the building. This white shape with the funny shaped roof, this is the cafeteria. So as employees are eating in the cafeteria, they can look out uh, windows here to this a garden area which was designed by an artist named Jim Sanborn and as part of that garden area he placed this sculpture called Kryptos. Kryptos is Greek for the word hidden and he put secret messages on this sculpture. Um, there are uh, so this is you know you can sign to see a uh, related to size and um, he did not know anything about codes at the time but uh, Jim Sanborn was taught about codes by Ed Scheidt who was the chairman of the CIA Cryptographic Center. Uh, he, Ed was introduced to Jim by William Webster, who was the director of the CIA at the time. And so Jim then learned some cryptographic techniques and uh, came up with the messages to carve into sculpture and carved these many letters by hand and then placed the sculpture there. So uh, three of the four messages have been found. So you can see there are these four plates of the sculpture. Two of them do not have secret messages. This is what's called a, a visionaire tableau. So you can see that there's an alphabet here. And then if you put a keyword in the alphabet, in this case, the keyword of cryptos, and then you have sort of a scrambled alphabet after it because you've taken out the letters of cryptos. And then you shift each one by one going down. So you have these lovely diagonals coming down here. And this is what's known as the visionaire tableau. And this type of cryptographic system was used to encrypt the first two messages that are on crypto. So we call them K1, K2, K3, and K4. So K1 is the top two lines on the sculpture and it decrypts to the phrase between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. So the Q there is, is a, not a typo on my slide. It's actually deliberate by Sanborn and I asked him if it was a typo on the sculpture. And he said, no, it's deliberate, but it's not what it is that's so important. It's where it is. It's the orientation or the positioning. Uh, he often gives very cryptic clues. So part two, also use Visionaire with some different keys. And it says, it was totally invisible. How's that possible? 
They used the Earth's magnetic field, X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location, X. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere, X. Who knows the exact location, X, or question mark? Only WW, this was his last message, X. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. X, layer 2. So uh, those uh, coordinates point to the garden in that area next to the cafeteria. They do not point to cryptos. They point to a location about 150 feet southeast. There's nothing there that we can find. Uh, we don't know what those coordinates are intended to refer to. So then part three says slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner and then widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X, can you see anything? Q. So history buffs here may recognize that this is a paraphrased extract from the diary of the archeologist Howard Carter on November 26, 1922, the day that he discovered King Tut's tomb. And uh, Sanborn said he liked that passage because he likened it to solving a code because just like when you're solving a code, you're like sifting away the layers and trying to get to the message underneath. Then there's part four, can't tell you what it says. Nobody knows. We've been working on it for what, about 30 years. Um, Sanborn has shown mercy at times, uh, sort of mercy. He has said that um, he gave us a clue. He's, in 2010, he gave us a clue and he said that at that position is the word Berlin. Flurry of activity on our part, no luck. He gave us another clue in 2014. He said there's the word clock, another flurry of activity. Um, we found some interesting things, but nothing close to an actual plain text, plain text solve. Early last year, he gave us another clue, Northeast. Then the pandemic hit and he decided to, he was bored and he decided to mix things up and offered yet another clue, the word East. So there we have about 10% of the plain text. We still can't solve the thing, uh, but uh, it is uh, very intriguing. Uh, so Cryptus has appeared many other places in popular culture. Uh, anyone who's heard of the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown, he wrote a sequel to the Da Vinci Code called The Lost Symbol. And cryptos is a theme in the book. He did not do this in partnership with Sanborn, but uh, so I wanted to make that clear because I'm sorry, does Dan Brown know the answer? No, Dan Brown does not know the answer. Uh, I did help him with the research for the novel. He actually helped me by naming, or he thanked me by naming a character after me in the book. So there's a character named Nola K, which is a scrambled version of Ilankin. So why has K4 been solved yet? Well, it's short. It's only 97 characters. So anyone who does code cracking will tell you that the more ciphertext that you have, uh, the easier it becomes to crack it because you can start finding those mathematical patterns. Uh, it's possible that there's a key on CIA grounds. This cryptos was never intended as a public challenge. It was only intended as a challenge to the employees at the CIA. So there may be something there that we just don't know about. Um, maybe we missed something. Maybe we've been misdirected. Uh, maybe the word Berlin, the words Berlin clock do not appear at that position in K4. Maybe he was just messing with us. And of course, maybe he messed it up and made a mistake. To our knowledge, no one has ever tested his puzzle to ensure that it is solvable. He says he's sure it's solvable, but no one, no one else has tested. So it's possible he made a mistake. We don't know. Uh, other things are named cryptos. It, cryptos is just a great word, Greek for hidden. So there's an album, there's a band, there's a company. This escape room is probably inspired by cryptos because they use the same font. Um, there is a board game and um, Rolls Royce released a limited edition car that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars called cryptos. And they have hidden messages all around the car with um, uh, there's a prize offered to the first one to crack these messages. They have not actually provided pictures of all the messages. We know that on the upholstery is this symbol, which is actually two R's for Rolls Royce. So that's RR. 
Also on the hood ornament of the car, there are some other symbols and they have said that those symbols say cryptos. So I'm looking forward to seeing more pictures of the car in the future. So um, anyone who wants more information about the sculpture, you can go to my website, elonka.com, or you can go to our book website, which is codebreaking-guide.com slash unsolved-cryptograms. So all of the messages we're going to tell you about, you can see more about them at that URL. So cryptos, there we have our unsolved crypto mystery. All right, next. Yes, uh, thanks, Ivanka. Our next uh, story um, takes us to the US again, uh, to New York State, the county of Essex. And on the next uh, slide, we will see. Uh, so I, I also want to point out all the Legos around uh, the map here. And this is, Klaus is famous for um, providing information about codes. Many of those codes have to do with crime scenes. And to reproduce the crime scenes, he often uh, does them in Legos. So you may see some very grisly scenes, but that are done with Legos. Um, for example, uh, you may see blood. It is not blood. It is, of course, strawberry jam. But um, yeah, so we have that. So moving on. Yes, uh, in the year 1882, a stranger named Henry de Bosnes came to Essex County in the state of New York. And uh, there he met a widow named Elizabeth Wells and he almost immediately started courting her. And after only a few weeks, the two married. And in fact, uh, it was not Henry de Bosnes' first marriage. Uh, he had been married twice to a woman named Judith and to a woman named Celestine, both of his uh, two first wives died early uh, after only a few years of marriage under um, strange circumstances. And now in 1882, he had his third wife named Elizabeth. But again, uh, this time the marriage was even shorter because after only a few months, uh, Elizabeth died or she was murdered, both stabbed, uh, stabbed and shot. And all this uh, happened within a pretty short time frame. On May the 1st, the Bosnes arrived in Essex County. Five weeks later, he married Elizabeth Wells and uh, three months later, later, Elizabeth was killed. And of course, Henry de Bosnes himself immediately became the prime suspect he was arrested and put into jail. And while he was waiting for his trial, he wrote and he painted pictures. Well, Henry de Bosnes was a very intelligent and well-educated man. Uh, he wrote poems, he drew nice pictures, he uh, wrote texts in several languages and he created a number of encrypted messages. Four encrypted messages, uh, well, he left behind four encrypted messages. You see excerpts from some of these on this picture. And after a few months in jail, his trial began on January 20th in 1883. He was found guilty by the jury and uh, two weeks after the uh, verdict, he was hanged on April 27th, 1883. And today his skull and the hangman's rope uh, are on display at the Adirondack History Museum in uh, Elizabethville, New York. And uh, there are still a few open questions about this case. Well, uh, first of all, the question is, was the Bosnian guilty? at all. Uh, he uh, never pled guilty himself, so there, there have been doubts about his guilt. And as I said, two of his earlier wives died early and under suspicious circumstances too. And it's not even clear who he actually was. Uh, during the trial, he said that he lived on a false identity and that his name was not really Henry de Bosnes, which might has, have been a lie. Perhaps he just wanted to confuse the jury. But it's possible that these questions could be answered 
uh, if these cryptograms he created while in jail could be broken, but so far this has not happened. Altogether, there are four cryptograms or four ciphertexts. The Bosnian spoke uh, English, French, Portuguese, Latin, and Greek. As I said, he was very well educated. So it's not even clear uh, what the plain text language of these encrypted texts might be, uh, let alone it's clear, is it clear what he wrote in these uh, encrypted messages? Uh, there's one uh, pretty important part. Uh, this uh, encrypted text looks like a poem. And uh, in fact, while in jail, uh, Henry de Bonis also wrote a poem that looked like this. He wrote it in Greek with Greek letters. And uh, as you can see here, there's a similarity between these two texts. And it's possible that the left side is an encrypted version of the poem on the right side. And of course, usually uh, such a crib, such a pretty long crypt is very helpful for a cryptanalyst when he wants to break uh, um, encrypted text of this kind. But in this case, uh, this hasn't helped at all. In spite of this potential crypt, the, this message and the others are still undeciphered. So who knows, perhaps uh, one, day, one day somebody will uh, decipher this text, uh, as you know, Last, last year in December, David Oranchek and two uh, of his partners broke one of the uh, ciphers of the Zodiac Killer. Perhaps uh, this will be the next cipher with a criminal background that will be broken and perhaps it will help us to understand what was going on 140 years ago. If you want to know more, we recommend this book by Jerry Farnsworth. The Adirondack Enigma. It's about the case of the Bosnians, not really about the cryptograms, but of course uh, the cryptograms are mentioned too. And uh, well, Jerry Farnsworth is uh, certainly not a crypto expert, but she brought this case back to public attention and it's certainly an interesting read. And well, as long as we don't know what is written in these strange ciphertexts, it's an unsolved crypto mystery. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to um, the Hamptons, Hamptons Notebook. And this is if you once the pandemic is over, if you can go to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. There is this enormous altar that was created by James Hampton, who's considered a United States outsider artist. He'd, he'd never had any uh, formal schooling, uh, didn't study art. And this uh, entire altar is actually made from very inexpensive materials. It's made from um, what we, I call aluminum foil or, or alum, aluminum um, and uh, glass. Uh, so you can see uh, this is the way it's put together. And he just kind of built this entire thing in, in his garage uh, when he wasn't working. Uh, the, um, along with this, there were several interesting, what looks like encrypted messages with it and you can see uh, kind of tags and, and little labels here and there. He also had this notebook that he filled uh, with many, many pages of what looks like encrypted text. Uh, we don't know what it says. Uh, he also had various charts. Obviously this is the 10 commandments but we haven't been able to make a link between what he's written and then the actual commandments. He actually made several copies of these. Uh, so it is a, a very in intriguing story and an unsolved crypto mystery. Yes, and now uh, we are going to Germany, to Hamburg, uh, which is actually a city in the north of Germany. And in the city center of Hamburg, uh, there's a, a small lake named the Außenalster. It's connected to a river named Alster, and it's also connected to a canal named uh, the Isebeck Canal. And in this area between uh, 2016 and 2019, nine cryptic bottle posts were found. And uh, here you can see uh, the bottles. Uh, these are only eight bottles because I don't have a picture of the ninth one. 
but uh, at least you can see that different bottles were used for these messages. And now we are going to look at the messages themselves. Uh, this is the first one that was found in October 2016. Mm. It was found in the Isebeck Canal. It's, it's a message uh, that looks encrypted, but there are also a few plain text words uh, like gebildet, uh, which is German for educated, or Körper, which is German for body. Then there are numerous letters that seem uh, that, that don't make uh, obvious sense, and there are numbers. So I have no idea what this is and if it's really an encrypted message and why anybody would would put something like this into a bottle and why somebody would throw this into water in, in the middle of Hamburg. This is uh, the second bottle post. Uh, this one was found in the Außenalster. You can see here different colors and uh, well, because different uh, pens were used apparently, but it's probably the same handwriting. So probably there's only one person behind all these messages. This one was found in January and this one, the third one, in April 2017. Again, it looks similar. This is number four. Again, similar style. Some words can be read, but there are many uh, single letters, numbers. And uh, this is number five. This one was written on on cardboard or on, on, a, on the inside of a secret package, actually. Uh, again found in the Isebeck Canal, and number six was found in July 2018. This one was found in a cola bottle in the Isebeck Canal too, and looks like the others. This is number seven, uh, also found in the Isebeck Canal. This one was in a, uh, what was, I think it's a, a liquor bottle or a rum bottle or something like that, a bigger, bo bigger bottle than most others, uh, than most of the others. And uh, well, until uh, two weeks ago, the, the eighth and last one uh, was found in July. And uh, a few days ago, a blog reader of mine um, made me aware of another bottle post uh, that was mentioned on a website. And uh, I don't know where exactly this was found. It's, it's only mentioned that it was found in Hamburg. And um, I, I don't know who found it and when it was found, but uh, this is clearly the ninth message of this kind uh, posted on imgur.com. And it came to our attention, as I said, just uh, like a week ago or so. So that means we have nine cryptic messages and we have absolutely no clue what these messages mean. Mm, I'm sure that there are more because uh, nine uh, messages have been brought to my attention. Uh, that there must be more. Were they all sent at the same time? We don't know. Mm. So far, the, well, until a few days, there has been no press coverage at all. So each time I write a blog post about these messages, which uh, has happened quite often, each time I send a press release to the local press in Hamburg, but so far none of, uh, no a newspaper or local radio station or so has covered these messages. But at least uh, they are mentioned in um, an article in the Computer Weekly now. So the Computer Weekly is the first publication or the, the first magazine apart from my blog that covers these messages. So I hope there will be more, more publicity be, because I'm sure there's more of this kind. And, but it should be possible to find out who created these messages and why, uh, but that's an absolute mystery so far. And of course, the main question is what what the purpose is of of these bottle posts. Uh, is it really a kind of secret communication? Well, honestly, I don't think so because in the twenty first century there are better ways of secret communication than a bottle post. Uh, is it uh, a part of a reality or a, a, a separate reality game or, or alternate reality game? Sorry. But I, I wouldn't know how this could be included in, a, in, in such a game. Uh, 
Uh, of course, it could also, also be a piece of art. Uh, there have been art projects um, of this kind, could be a hoax. And of course, it's possible that all these messages were created by a person with a mental disorder. But basically, I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, and I really hope that this unsolved crypto mystery will be solved. Perhaps it's going to happen this year. The chances are not too bad. I think there have been two questions, sorry, in the chat. Is there anything we should reply to right now? Uh, are there techniques you can use to help decide if a code is unsolved or unsolvable? Um, well, there are techniques, but uh, I think there's uh, usually not a definitive answer. Uh, so if there's not uh, um, enough, um, no, no, sorry. Um, if, if there's too much repetition or if, if all the uh, letters in, in uh, text uh, are the same or something like that, you can be uh, sure that it's, it doesn't have a real meaning. But apart from that, basically every message could be or could be solvable. There are just uh, some uh, uh, properties uh, that make it more probable that it's not solvable. And uh, yes, uh, I think the answer is no. Can cryptos be visited or do you need special permission? Well, Ilonka, that's a question for you. Yeah, why don't we, uh, uh, let's wait until the end okay. and because uh, I can talk on that for quite a while. <laughs> we'll see how much time we have left. Um, but it's a great question. So, um, all right, so let's go on to, uh, now we're gonna go to England and we have the pigeon message, which uh, some of you I'm sure have heard of. It, it made a lot of news in 2012. Uh, it was actually uh, in, um, in Surrey in 1982, a man while uh, cleaning his chimney found the remains of a carrier pigeon uh, from World War II. It actually still had the message strapped to its leg and uh, it, the message was encrypted. So we're pretty sure that it was sent on D-Day from Normandy. Um, and uh, then the pigeon got as far as Surrey and then was probably um, overcome by something and fell into the chimney. Uh, where it was on its way to, um, well, I'll, I'll go into that. Um, pigeons, a lot of carrier pigeons were used in World War II. There were hundreds of thousands. Uh, pilots carried them so that if the plane went down, they could release a pigeon. Paratroopers brought them in. And uh, just as a side note, not related to this particular pigeon, but there is a medal called the Dickon Medal that was uh, offered to several kinds of animals, dogs and horses and cats and pigeons. Um, and I, I just found this fascinating. Like if a, a pigeon was um, perhaps uh, made the fastest trip or maybe it was injured and still made the journey uh, there were a few that got medals, which I think is just delightful. So now uh, this particular message, you can see there is the, uh, the capsule. The, uh, the red capsule gives us one clue. This was used by the US forces and the British army. Others had different colors of capsules. And um, we know that it was going to X02, which meant RAF Bomber Command at the time that was at, at High Wycombe. Uh, the, um, aside from the encrypted message, we have these uh, numbers here, and these were the identifiers of the pigeons. So there were two copies of this message, and these are the two pigeons. NURP uh, means the uh, National Union of Racing Pigeons. The numbers are the years that the pigeons were, were born or banded, uh, so uh, 1940 and 1937. And then TW and DK are probably, or, or certainly where the pigeons are from. There's some am ambiguity about what exactly the initials mean. If anyone knows for sure, uh, please let us know. We, we make some good guesses. And then the 194 and 76 were the numbers. So when they were banded, these are the numbers that the pigeons were given. So, um, so the TW and DK. So TW probably meant um, Tunbridge Wells, might have meant uh, Twickenham. DK probably meant Dorking. So again, this is what the uh, Union of Racing Pigeons, these, was where the, these are where the pigeons were heading back to. So getting back to the message, we have some other numbers. We know when the form was filled in, 1522. Also up here, I should point out, this is a pigeon service form. So um, we know that the message was created at 
1525, and then that slash six probably means June 6, 1944. Uh, then the pigeons were released, Libere, uh, at uh, 1625. So it was all happening fairly quickly. This other number 27 means the number of letter groups that were in the cipher. And again, the six is probably June 6. And there two down there is the number of copies. And then we also have, um, we should point out that there's different handwriting used. So one person filled in the message and another it was probably handed off to someone, probably someone French, who then wrote the numbers about the pigeons and freed the, uh, the pigeons. The uh, signature down there at the bottom, we are fairly sure, but not 100% certain, was a Sergeant W. Stott, 27 years old, a paratrooper, who did parachute into occupied Normandy on a reconnaissance mission. Uh, sadly, he passed away, uh, not that day, but, but shortly thereafter that year. Uh, it was uh, yeah, uh, during the war. So uh, coming back to the groups of letters, the 27 groups, we, we do know that the first and last group are the same, A-O-A-K-N. This is probably some sort of indicator, though we don't know for what, because we don't know which cipher system was used. I mean, it could have been, there were manual ciphers being used at the time. This is double transposition, an example. Uh, possibly it meant a code book. Possibly there was an encryption machine involved and possibly it was a one-time pad. Uh, <clears throat> to be a one-time pad, there would have had to have been some indication of which pad to use. Normally this was done with a number so we don't see a number here, but then again, the AOAKN may have been an encrypted form of a number. Again, we just don't know. Uh, types of machines that were in use at the time. On the left, we have the Type X. Then in the middle, we have the M209. And on the right, we have the Rock X. Um, they're obviously different sizes. The one, the Rock X and the Type X, fairly large, probably not uh, usable by a paratrooper unless they were like already there. The M209 is a much more interesting choice because this is something that was handheld. Uh, you could see, I hope you can see my mouse. They would, uh, this has six wheels. They would wheel in a key and then they would use this knob over here to dial in a letter they were encrypting. And then there's a little thumb switch over here. They would press this with their thumb and then a ciphertext letter would be printed on a tiny little strip of paper. So the ciphertext would come out and then they would uh, transcribe from that paper to the pigeon service form. If this is what was used, again, we don't know for sure. Um, if, so a question to the audience. I know we have some people here who are very uh, uh, history buffs and very interested in these kinds of things. So at the end of our talk, if anyone has any thoughts about what type of machine might have been used, we are very, very interested in hearing them. Uh, so, but for now, we will say the pigeon cryptogram is another unsolved crypto mystery. And uh, the next unsolved crypto mystery brings us to London. Uh, it was uh, in the 1990s or in, in 1995, to be more precise, when a London based rock musician named uh, Chris Jeffs, or his stage name was Silop when he purchased a 16 page booklet in a London bookstore. And uh, this 16 page booklet looked quite strange. This is the title page. You see there are no letters, no numbers, nothing that can be read. And the content or the actual content of this book looks uh, pretty much the same. On each page, we see these rectangular symbols and we see these diagrams uh, that might uh, stand for a, a room or something like that. And this is it. There are no page numbers. Uh, there's no indication of the publisher of this book. All we can see are these rectangular um, shapes and a few diagrams. This is the last page and this is uh, the real page and that's it. Only one specimen of this booklet is known, although it is printed. So it's, I'm pretty sure that there have been more copies of it, but I've only seen this particular one so far. Mm, as I already mentioned, there are no uh, letters or numbers. 
The meaning of these rectangular symbols is completely unknown. And most of all, the purpose of this booklet is completely unknown. And I have introduced uh, this Silop booklet on my blog uh, several times. Each time my readers have commented on it, but so far nobody has really found a, a good explanation on what this booklet is about. At least it's clear that there are 24 different uh, symbols. Well, some might be uh, variants of others, but basically we have 24 different symbols, uh, which is consistent with an encrypted text, of course. And readers of my blog have made a transcript. And uh, of course, they, they have conducted the frequency analysis and other statistical tests. And again, these tests are consistent uh, with an encrypted text, but that's it. And nobody has ever deciphered this uh, encrypted message, if it really is an encrypted message, because there are, of course, other explanations that seem possible. Uh, for example, uh, those of you who already used the computer back in the 1980s, you might remember that there was a, a certain kind of copy protection, especially for computer games. So when you purchase the computer game, uh, such a, a table, sometimes in color, was included. And before you could start the game, you were asked to type in, uh, let's say, the color of box R1. In this case, uh, the box R1 has uh, a black color, so you had to enter B, and then you could start uh, playing the game. And of course, well, the, the, the idea is that back in the 1980s, copiers, uh, let alone color copiers, were expensive. So it was a lot more difficult to copy such a table than to copy a computer program. And so this kind of copy protection worked reasonably well uh, 30 or 35 years ago. And the question now is, of course, is the Silop cryptogram such a copy protection means too? There are certain similarities, but uh, usually if you look at, at such a, a table, at least the, the name of the computer game is mentioned and most of them are in color, and uh, most of them are smaller. You don't need uh, 16 pages for such a table. So uh, copy protection doesn't uh, look uh, sound very plausible. And especially uh, for copy protection, you need a reference to the symbols, but they are not numbered. Uh, it's not even clear at first view uh, where the start and where the end of the book is. So this was not very... Uh, it was not really feasible to you to be used as a copy protection. So in my view, this is not the correct explanation. But was it an intelligence test? Uh, that's also an idea that came up on my blog. And in fact, there are intelligence tests that look similar, like or that, that contain these or uh, include these symbols that you also see in a similar way uh, in the silo cryptogram. But uh, usually, if you look at uh, an intelligence test, you see that there's a question and that there are potential answers. And this is not the case with the silo cryptogram. So uh, perhaps it's a part of the intelligence test to find out what is actually uh, the question here. But uh, in general, I don't think that this is the correct explanation either. Mm, a more interesting potential explanation is a uh, game accessory. Of course, uh, there are numerous board games and computer games that include uh, uh, some booklets uh, that, that are used for, for the actual game. And it's, of course, possible that the silo cryptogram originally was printed to be included in such a game. But again, this was discussed on my blog, but no blog reader has ever found a game that really fits with this booklet. Of course, it's possible that these diagrams stands for, stand for game levels or platforms, and perhaps these rectangular symbols represent a code that has to be entered somewhere. But um, it could be, could might have been used in a computer game or scavenger hunt or escape room. But uh, and uh, the, the absence of letters and numbers might simply uh, have the purpose of making this book look more mysterious. All this is possible, but as I said, nobody has ever found a game that uh, really fits with this uh, booklet, uh, let alone that somebody has ever used this for a particular game. So 
Meanwhile, my favorite explanation of this cryptogram is that it's simply a piece of art. Um, a few weeks ago, a blog reader has made me aware of a French artist uh, I had known before. His name is Guy de Cointet. He died 37 years ago. And some of his paintings uh, consist of or show geometric figures. So that's similar. And most of all, he created at least one booklet uh, that has about the same size as the silo cryptogram. And it also contains um, uh, geometrical uh, uh, shapes that can be interpreted as uh, encrypted text. And in fact, some of these um, uh, sequences can even be deciphered, so they re represent uh, encrypted messages. Uh, this particular book is named A Captain from Portugal. It doesn't contain any numbers or letters, so um, it's quite similar as the Silo cryptogram. So I don't think that the Silo cryptogram was created by Guy de Quante, or at least I haven't found any evidence for this, but it might have been created by an artist who was influenced by Guy de Conte. So that's uh, the best explanation I have so far. And my question to the audience would be, if you have uh, ever seen anything like the silo cryptogram, or if you even know what it means or what, what its purpose was, so please let me know. After five years or so, I would be very interested in solving this uh, unsolved crypto mystery. And well, as I said, it's still an unsolved crypto mystery. Perhaps it can be solved one day. So um, there are many more, and, and we just don't have time for them. Uh, we did want to mention, of course, the, uh, the one on the left, the Zodiac, uh, the, um, which uh, was partially solved, the Z340, uh, which had been unsolved for many, many years. And on December 11th, uh, a group, an international group cracked it. We actually have at least one of those people on the call, Dave Aranchak, who contacted me at, at 6 a.m. one morning and saying, we did it, we did it. You're going to have to update your book because <laughs> we had just released our book on December 10th and then he cracked it on December 11th. Uh, so uh, we already have a, a, a rata page on our website. But uh, again, I, I just cannot Congratulate Dave on that. That was an amazing accomplishment there. Um, the Voynich manuscript, uh, 500 years old, uh, just hundreds of pages. We don't know what it says. We don't recognize the alphabet. We don't recognize the plants. Uh, it is considered the world's uh, most mysterious manuscript. And on the right, uh, something that was the sensation in Australia in the 1940s, the Summerton Man, a, a body showed up on a on a beach there and uh, no identity. His, all the tags had been removed from his clothing uh, with this picture widely circulated in Australian press and no one could identify him. And there was of course an encrypted message involved as well to add to the mystery. So um, there are many, many other uh, not so famous crypto mysteries. I'm just gonna briefly touch on them. Uh, on the left here, we're gonna go up to Kaliningrad also known as Konigsberg uh, which was uh, very uh, popular or infamous during the Cold War because this is where submarines would come to port. So on the left, we have Baltus or Pilau, and this was a closed city. Uh, you could not uh, get in unless you had permission to go there. So of course, spies flocked to the city. It, it was very popular in the spy community. And one way that spies communicate is with dead drops, meaning that they uh, put a message inside some, some sort of a container. They casually leave it somewhere and walk away. And then later on, someone comes by and retrieves the container with the message. And we think that's what happened. Uh, so in uh, Baltisk Palau, uh, during construction around this building in 2015, a message was found in a bottle. Uh, and so we think it was from the 1950s. We think it is a, a Cold War dead drop. If we're going to take this text and transcribe it, it was transcribed by uh, Thomas Ernst, who was uh, working on this uh, feverishly. And uh, so it's clearly encrypted, but uh, we don't yet know what it says. So it is an unsolved crypto mystery. Uh, next, again, very briefly, there is a movie about spies called Fair Game that came out in 2010. And if you looked closely at the credits of the movie, there were certain letters that were highlighted in yellow. 
right? Which is the kind of thing that might come out with steganography or some sort of code. So if you take all those letters and string them together, it sure looks like a code, but no one has been able to crack it. Uh, we've tried contacting the, the credit designer, Frederick Sundwall, uh, have not received a reply. His daughter is evidently quite a famous actress, um, but as we don't know for sure if it is a code or if it was just an art choice, but it's out there as an unsolved code. And uh, then we have uh, the cigarette case cryptogram. So this, we're gonna go back uh, about a hundred years to Thuringia in Germany. A, uh, someone brought forth uh, something they said was uh, in their family and it was a cigarette case from 1909. You can see it's beautifully engraved. And on the inside where the cigarettes would be held, it which is what looks like a dedication and engraving. And uh, we don't know what it says. It's probably German, but we're not sure. Uh, we have uh, the 24th of December, 1909. So Christmas Eve, this is when uh, gifts were given in Germany. They give them on Christmas Eve, not on Christmas day. Uh, but since it is a Christmas present, perhaps somewhere in the text, it says, Frohe Weihnachten, Merry Christmas. Uh, we don't know uh, if the words are correct. If this is the beginning of a word though, it's, it's a little odd because Germany or German doesn't have a word like that where it's the two identical letters at the beginning of a line. Of course, it might be wrapped around, we don't know, um, but we just haven't been able to figure anything out. And it's especially odd because we have other examples of encryptions from that time period, like from postcards uh, of course, when someone wrote a postcard and they're sending it to um, in, in, an intimate, a, a spouse or a lover, and, and they don't want everyone else reading the postcard, the family and the postman and everyone else who's passing the postcard along. So they would come up with codes and ciphers to uh, write these messages to their friends. And we've cracked uh, most of these or all of these or, or nearly all of these. Uh, they usually use quite simple ciphers. And so we know the kind of thing that was used around that time period, but then we have the cigarette case and we do not yet know what it says. So it remains an unsolved crypto mystery. And of course there are many more, but we just don't have time for them. And we'd love to hear your questions and go to your questions. So thank you very much. Uh, this has been, uh, again, an honor to come and speak. Thank you, Ilonka and Klaus. There was one question about visiting cryptos. Um, so crypto, CIA is locked up tight. Um, the, uh, you cannot get it. I tried once uh, in a, yeah, around 2002, my cousin and I tried to just drive up to CIA and there were large men with guns who said no. <laughs> And <laughs> we drove away. I have been invited there twice, uh, uh, once to give a talk about Al Qaeda codes and another time specifically to see cryptos and uh, seeing cryptos after having worked on it for what was it, 16 years at the time. Um, people said, what was it like? And I said, it's like seeing an old friend. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was great. So anyone who wants to see more pictures of cryptos, I recommend my website, um, ilanka.com slash cryptos. Thank you. There's a comment um, in the chat, the last comment, which I think refers to the Scilob uh, encryption. Yes. Uh, if it is an, a test, well, an uh, intelligence test, two or three pages of response might bring the next book. Uh, so, so, sorry, what, what do you mean by this? Two or three pages of response? not really obvious where you would send these send the response to so that's from michael if, if michael would like to unmute he could uh, uh yes if, if you could please there might be that much of a response i mean it looked like it's really something it looks like there's something going on there that's all i'm saying okay i don't know no, why you submit but this, we don't know where this is submitted, I guess, in a bookstore. I mean, I can't think it fell out somewhere. Uh, yes, well, uh, Silop, this musician, purchased uh, this booklet in a bookstore. Uh, I think it was in London uh, near Charing Cross. Uh, well, there are pretty many bookstores near Charing Cross. But mm. this was a, a small one. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. And it was given away for free. So at least that's what he writes on his blog. 
he uh, writes that uh, there were more books of this kind and they were given away for free in this uh, store. And uh, according to uh, the staff, uh, these booklets were, were brought by a man. Uh, a man uh, provided them to give them away. That's all I know about the background story. Okay, so you think that uh, somehow in there isn't where to submit it. I mean, that might be part of what's in them. If there's something going on in there from the looks of it, that's all I'm saying. Okay, yes, I agree. It, it looks it looks like something real. Um, but apart from that, I have no idea. That's a good one. I'll say also that's a good one. That's an excellent Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh, there's one about the pigeon cipher, Ilonka. Um, type X put five rotor. So, um, so Type X was that a five rotor system? I know there were more, more than five. As far, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think Type X had more than. Uh, or oh, Jerry, do do you know how many rotors the Type X had? Five. Well, yes, 12? I believe that is the case. Yes. Yes. So it was effectively, a, it could be used as an enigma by through wiring two of the rotors and then uh, rewiring three of the rotors to match enigma uh, wheels. Okay, so um, well, it's probably unlikely that uh, these uh, five letters at the beginning and at the end of the message uh, stood for um, a type X key because the type X had more than five rotors. So but it um, could be could be an identification that was used for a key book, and in the key book, uh, the whole key was given. But yeah. uh, I, I don't know this, just a guess. Yeah, and of course, five was... letter groups is very common anyway. T type X did have five rotors. Um, I, I've done a simulation on it. I've learned a lot about Typex, and Typex has five rotors. And one of the formats written down that they used was to put the five. They would choose five letters um, in the rotor, to, okay. for the, the five rotors, um, and send that at the beginning and end of the, the message. So that does uh, match what you have. Okay, so that would be one possibility that it's uh, may, maybe even an encrypted. Uh, perhaps it was uh, the. The message key that was encrypted with a day key or something like that in a similar way as it was done with the enigma yeah. but could be any other key or encrypted key or key identifier as well yeah. so martin you said you have a, a a computer simulator for the type x yes he's just put the link in chat oh okay thanks well, have at it. <laughs> when you crack it, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have tried, but it's not. Uh, it, we don't know what the rotors they have. Um, GCHQ haven't released any of the rotors uh, for it, so that makes it kind of oh. tricky. <laughs> uh. So the rotors. How many different rotors could there be? Uh, I think they had a choice of. Uh, I have to look it up. It's choice of seven or so. I think. Well, there's a so, bunch of collectors. Aren't there collectors who have the type X that we could uh, get some of that information from? Uh, I, possibly. I, I don't know whether anyone is allowed to, I and mean, GCHQ certainly won't let you check through their wiring. It is still <laughs> uh, well undercover at the moment, and they are not releasing them. They, they have said they're not releasing them at the moment. So, uh, Klaus and I may know someone Klaus, who uh, has a type X. So. <laughs> This is something to pursue. <laughs> yeah. No, that's I'd love exciting. to know if you do. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Poss uh, po possibly, um, possibly Paul and Mark in Eindhoven. Do they have? I know that there's one in, in Bletchley Park or in, in the Museum of Computing, Jerry. That, don't you have a Typex? Uh, no, we do, no we do not. No, we do not. Maybe there's one in Bletchley Park. Uh, okay, I, I think I've but, seen one there. I, I don't know if it was in, in the TNMOC or in, in at Bletchley uh, Park, but I'm, I'm not sure. Just Yeah, actually, um, 
Peter H., what's that that they have in the bomb room on next to the uh, window? Is that not a Typex or is that just a... They've got two checking machines. Yes, that's right. We did have one on loan, didn't we? But it's been returned. I never saw it. Mm. They have got parts of the Typex, but they're kind of manufactured ones. They've got the um, the plug board. Yes. And, and a couple of rotors, uh, straight through rotors, but not wired ones. Yes. Yeah. Hard to imagine a Typex being lugged over to uh, dunk to D-Day landings, actually, though, isn't it? Mm. I think they did, and they think they had to leave a lot of them there. They took the rotors with them, but there was a... I think they were taken with them. I wouldn't want to carry one. And <laughs> Sounds like something for the crypto collectors group. We could uh, post and say, you know, has someone found one or uh, has Tom Pereira found one at the bottom of a lake somewhere? That, uh, <laughs> we can take a look at the rotors. Okay. Um, I, I got a private question about how to learn more about codes. Um, well, of course, our book is designed for um, all levels, beginners to experts. Um, there are many stories in there that we think people who have nothing to do with codes would enjoy. We've, we've gotten several good reviews. And those who really want to dig in and uh, crack something, we have information about that as well. Uh, beyond our book, I highly recommend a book by Simon Singh called The Code Book. And... Um, uh, there's, of course, a great one in 1939 by Helen Fouché Gaines called Cryptanalysis. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd recommend that one for a beginner, though, but it, it's definitely got a lot of great information there. So, um, yeah, Simon Singh. And then uh, David Kahn has written The Gold Standard, a book called The Code Breakers. Uh, there are two different editions of that. I recommend that those as well. Um, let's see, any other, oh, slides, yeah, and there will be a recording of the talk, and the, so the slides will definitely be available. Um, just checking. Any other questions? Any other thoughts on how to crack any of these? We're always listening. Uh, just say on the um, uh, Bletchley Park uh, Typex machine, I think it's uh, one to illustrate how the Typex could be an enigma. So it has the wiring on it to uh, indicate that, which presumably would then fit with uh, GCHQ keeping everything secret in terms of real use of Type X, but uh, convey the story of it being used to emulate an enigma. Yes, because we still have the um, some parts of the conversion, don't we, that made it into an enigma in a cabinet in the bomb room, as I recall. Not sure. Yeah, it's a plug, plug yeah. board for a reflector or something like that. Oh, yeah. Any other questions, comments? A fantastic kind of... book. Really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we love to hear comments like these. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, go ahead. Yes, about the pigeon message seems more likely the pigeon message is some kind of field code unless you got access to a caption <laughs> enigma. Yes, well, I agree. A field code is more uh, likely. Well, uh, I, I think I have one question to the audience. Now, one of the machines we introduced uh, was the M209. Uh, well, the M209 is, of course, a US machine. Uh, does, does anybody know if uh, uh, the M209 was used by British troops on D-Day or if the Americans uh, had uh, a pigeon connection to Great Britain uh, on D-Day? So is, is there a possibility that this machine was actually used for the pigeon message? <laughs> okay, so nobody really knows. But it's at least an option, although it's it's not really clear if uh, if the British had uh, even access to this machine in uh, this environment. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. Uh, the M209 has six rotors, so the first and the last wouldn't match up if uh, the first five letters are actually uh, the key or if they represent the key. 
And there's still a possibility uh, that has happened before that one of the roles was kept constant and that only five uh, five digits were used uh, as a key. There's one famous story about the decipherment of a message that was sent in the Congo uh, after the death of Patrice Lumumba. It, it was broken by a Dutch cryptologist named Bart Brenel, and he had some trouble to decipher this message because he was looking for a machine uh, that used uh, a five-digit key, and he only found ma uh, machines that used a six-digit key. And in the end, uh, it was clear that the, the problem was that one of the digits was kept constant, and this is why a five-digit key was used. Very stupid way to use such a machine, but it happened. Someone saying something about the clip setting? Uh, yes, uh, well, that's uh, correct. Uh, the M209 has, uh, as far as I know, at least, uh, it, it has three different keys. Uh, the first one is uh, the, the numbers or the, the rotor positions, and then it's the clippings, and then it's uh, the position of the uh, of, of these uh, pieces you have to, to put on, on the basket inside the machine. So there were, uh, the key consisted of three different parts. So having the uh, combination or having uh, the rotor position was not sufficient to decrypt the message, but uh, the, the other parts of the key were usually kept constant for a certain time, or at least for a day, usually. So, any more for any more? Yes, uh, there are actually not enough characters for an M209 key. That's certainly correct. Unless only a part of the key was used, which is certainly a possibility. But of course, uh, this would have not been a good idea to use the machine this way. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again for inviting us. Uh, You're this welcome. has again thank been you. an honor. Uh, and uh, hopefully maybe someone has an idea and can come to us and say, call me at six o'clock in the morning and say, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I will prepare to close the call. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Please keep looking at our events, uh, TNMOC events page. We have, uh, we're adding talks almost daily <laughs> and uh, hope to see you all again thank you very much thanks goodbye goodbye